Well, good morning. Let's stand to our feet this morning. If you're out in the hallways, come on inside. We're so glad to be here if you're at home, at work, in the office. We're so glad you're able to tune in with us this morning. Let's just praise God across this place. We can clap to him. Come on. We are celebrating a weekend. We're going into celebrating a weekend of independence. And as, one, as much as we love our independence as a, as a nation, as a people, there is no better freedom. There's no greater freedom than what God purchased through us. What Jesus gave to us on the cross. So we can praise him this morning. Let's clap to him. Let's shout to him. I don't know what's going on in your life this morning, but hallelujah, Lord, you are good. You're awesome. My hope is in you, Lord, all the day long. And I won't be shaken by drought or storm. The peace that passes understanding is my song. And I sing, my hope is in you, Lord. You are good, Lord. You are awesome. I meet with you. is in you. My hope is in you, Lord, all the day long. And I won't be shaken by drought or storm. The peace that passes understanding is my song. And I sing, my hope is in you, Lord. Yes, Lord. Our hope is in you. See you guys. Amen. Thanks for uh, praying for my kidney stone ordeal. I uh, I have a new definition and an understanding of pain now than I had before. <laughs> it's uh, it's pretty awful. So you have my sympathy if you ever get one, and uh, I will pray for you like you guys prayed for me. So it's great to see you. Uh, great to see you online. Thanks for always uh, joining us. 
If you are new, especially to today, it's, which may not be too likely on a holiday, but hopefully maybe someone is new, uh, seat backs in front of you is our Connect card. Fill it out for information, fill it out for prayer requests, anything like that. We'd be glad to, to encourage you and your family any way that we can. Uh, we love Jesus Christ with all of our hearts here, and we want you to love and follow him uh, too. And so anything, anything that we can do to help with that would be great. A couple of quick announcements. Um, VBS. Uh, if you're working with VBS or if you want to work with VBS, starting on Wednesdays, we're doing song. Wednesdays at 10 a.m., we're doing song and dance movement practice. I need a lot of practice, so I will try to be there. I'm kind of stiff in my dance moves. So if you want to join with that and learn and get ready for VBS coming in August, that'd be awesome. Uh, save the date. There's also a women's conference coming up in August. Uh, look online for information, those kinds of things. We'd love to have you participate in that. And then just to give you a quick report, we had over $1,000 raised for the car wash that we did last weekend. And that goes to, uh, so thanks for participating. That goes to subsidize the, the cost of Work Camp New England, which is really expensive. And so we try to invest in it and drive the cost down for you guys. So appreciate your help in that as well. Good to see you. Welcome again. And uh, let's continue to uh, worship the Lord. If you're reading along with the Bible readings in Ezra, they lay the foundation of the temple and they all get very excited. They have this big worship service. The foundation has been laid, a slab. The foundation has been laid. And it says some wept and some shouted and you couldn't tell the difference over rocks. But they had an understanding of what that meant, what had been taken, what was back. Corinthians tells us that we have a foundation. If they got excited over rocks to build a temple that they could go to to commit to do sacrifices where God's presence was. How excited should we get knowing that Christ is our foundation? We have a foundation in Christ where we are a living temple. Can you shout this morning? Can you clap this morning? Can you be grateful this morning that God loves you? We're going to sing a song. And if you went to camp back in the 80s or 90s, you'll know this song. It's a, it's a very simple song, but it's, it's a song appreciating that. It's just, these, these next few songs are just about appreciating what God has done, that Jesus is our foundation. We don't look to rocks. We don't look to buildings. We have Jesus. We have the presence, the Holy Spirit. He has given us, and that's awesome. So we sing. Father, I adore you. Lay my life before you, how I love you. I adore you, lay my life before you, how I love you. Jesus, eu te adoro, minha vida eu te entrego. adore you lay my life before you Oh. 
awesome. He is worthy. No sweeter name. No sweeter name than the name of Jesus. No sweeter name not a foundation built with things of this earth that are corruptible but Lord the perfect your name is like honey on my lips your spirit's like water to my soul your word is a lamp unto my feet Jesus I love you 
Your name is like honey on my lips. Your spirit's like water to my soul. Your word is a lamp unto my feet. Jesus, I love you. name again. for him this morning. Lord, I love you. You said, blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, but they will be filled. Are you hungry and thirsty this morning? Oh, Lord, we're thirsty. We're hungry. Oh, we're thirsty. We're thirsty, Lord, for more of you. Worship you this morning. Worship you. Lord, we worship you. Worship you. We worship you. See, worship. Worship you. Oh, Lord, we lie out for you this morning. Worship you. Your name is like honey on my lips. Your spirit's like water to my soul. Your word is a lamp unto my feet. Jesus, I love you. I love you. Let's uh, let's pray together, Father. Uh, we are incredibly grateful for this day, uh, for the gift of life to uh, be able to worship together, to gather, uh, to listen. Uh, to your word, to pray uh, together. Uh, one of the things I missed most while I was away was just being able to pray with each other and, and be together in this fellowship. And so, uh, Father, I, uh, I just have a couple things I'd like to, to pray for today. Um, I want to just say thank you uh, for the country that we live in, for this great uh, nation. Uh, this experiment started so many years ago, and, and uh, we're trying to... Uh, be free and, and, and love justice and all those kinds of things. And, uh, Father, I know uh, that our country is not perfect, but it's a pretty awesome place to live. I know many, many have uh, sacrificed much in our military to uh, allow us to be free. And so we're grateful for them uh, today. Uh, Father, I'm also uh, wanted to pray and thank you for uh, what you've done um, through the Supreme Court uh, with Roe v. Wade. And uh, I was nine years old when this thing started and feel like I've been praying forever for life to be honored and little ones to be protected in their womb. And um, you're starting to do some of those things, Father. But I also know uh, there's a lot of heartache around this issue and there's a lot of uh, differences of opinions. But, but Father, we just want to honor the gift of life in both 
the young and the old, we, we know that you value all life. Especially pray for our crisis pregnancy center in, in Worcester that we support. Uh, they've been receiving threats and, and people aren't being very kind. Um, and I just uh, pray that you keep them safe and allow them to have a great, great ministry of helping uh, moms just make it through this very difficult time uh, when they have unexpected pregnancies and those kinds of things. Father, uh, more than anything through all that happens in our nation that we love, uh, I pray that we would uh, bend our knees and our hearts towards you, Jesus. Uh, you're our hope, you're our salvation. We have nothing without you, your life, your death, and your resurrection. And we just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. We love you. We lift all these things up in your name. Continue to speak to us now as we continue to worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Good morning. A lot of movement on stage this morning. I like it. <laughs> My name is Josh King. I'm the director of student ministries, in case you're new here. So I get to uh, preach this morning. So thank you so much for coming and happy 4th of July. Thanks for coming to church on a holiday weekend. I really do appreciate it. So <laughs> uh, this morning we are going to be talking about waging war. I know that might sound a little intense and I don't know, it's just because it's 4th of July weekend and I've been thinking about that or uh, if we... We're going through the Bible in a, through a reading plan, and a lot of what we've, we've been reading about is, I don't know, kingdoms coming in and war happening, so a lot of that stuff has been on my brain. And so I want to talk about how does a Christian wage war against evil in this world? And so summary in a sentence here, uh, I'm trying to convince you that by praying and reading your Bible and resting in God, God will change you and you will authentically live out your purpose and then trusting in God, he is the one that ultimately wages war against evil in this world. Uh, to start, I wanted to show a quick clip from one of my favorite movies. It's called Gettysburg. Anyone see that movie? It's only four and a half hours long, so it's, it's a good one. Uh, when, when I first got it, it was on two VHS tapes. That shows you a little how old I am. But um, so this is, it's based on a true story. <laughs> uh, and this scene is, is true. Uh, and the scene we're gonna watch, the clip we're gonna watch is a turning point in the Civil War. Joshua Chamberlain, uh, he's from Maine. He's the commanding officer here. And he, uh, he is in charge of the leftmost flank of the Union Army here. And he is told by his commanding officer, he says, you cannot let the rebels pass you. If they make it past you, then they're gonna have a way to attack the rest of the Union Army. And if they lose the Battle of Gettysburg, then they might lose the entire war. And if they lose the war, then you, the United States might not be united. So a lot is on the line here for Joshua Chamberlain. And uh, let's see what happens. Half a minute down. Most of the rest are wounded. The left is too thin, sir. How are we fixed for ammunition? It's almost gone. Sir, we're running out. We don't have much left to shoot with. Some of the boys got nothing at all. Sir, sir, what do we do for ammunition? Sir, my boys have to bread muskets and they're back with them. Sir, we ought to pull out. No, we can't do that. We can't hold them again, sir. You know that. Well, if we don't, they go on by and over the hill and the whole flank caves in. Sir. Here they come. Well, we can't run away. If we stay here, we can't shoot. So let's fix bayonets. Have the advantage of moving down the hill. They gotta be tired, the revs. They gotta be close to the end if we are. So fix bayonets. Ellis, wait, Ellis, you take the left wing, I'll take the right. I want a right wheel forward of the whole regiment. What, you mean charge? Yes, but here's what we do. We're going to charge swinging down the hill. Just like we pulled back to this left side of the regiment, now we're going to swing it down. We swing like a door. We're gonna sweep them down the hill just as they come up. Understand? Does everybody understand? Yes, yes sir. sir. Okay, Ellis, you take the left wing, and when I give the command, I want the whole regiment to go forward, swinging down to the right. All right, sir. Fine. Move. Hey, I love 
love that intensity. I also love his mustache. I think I might grow one, but what do you think? So, uh, so he was in a desperate situation in Joshua Chamberlain. He was also brilliant. Uh, he was a believer. He went to seminary. Uh, he was a professor at that time before he volunteered for the war. And he had this crazy idea. It was unforeseen and it was surprising. And it was this little small action. It was just his little troop there, but it had a huge positive consequence because they were all able to hold their ground. The United States uh, is united. Uh, this morning, we're talking about how Christians wage war. And this is a theme that goes throughout the Bible, and Paul, when he wrote the New Testament, picked up on it a lot. In 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 4, he says, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, the weapons we have, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. As individuals, yeah, we don't wage war with physical weapons, uh, but with prayer. We fight a spiritual battle. Uh, there is a spiritual aspect to everything going on behind the scenes. In America, we're so focused on science and the things that we can physically see. Uh, we miss the spiritual aspect so much. Um, but there's a spiritual battle out there that I think is the most important one. And, and prayer is our bayonet. Um, and Daniel realized what was going on behind the scenes. Um, last week, we started the book of Daniel, and this week we're going to be finishing it and talking about Daniel in the lion's den. And he knew how to wage the spiritual battle in the face of extreme evil. And so we're going to pray and read the text this morning. Uh, just a heads up, we're going to read the entire thing, but I'm really just going to focus on a first section too. And this sermon is going to be kind of maybe more practical with lots of book recommendations. So just brace yourself for that. So, um, so let's pray and then read the passage. Jesus, thank you so much for uh, everyone here. Thank you um, that the people here uh, in person and online are, uh, are sacrificing the time to be with each other and more importantly, be with you on a holiday weekend. We pray uh, that you bless the reading of your word. Uh, bless my words. If they're from you, um, may they affect our lives and our hearts and transform our character. Uh, but if they're just from me, may they hit the floor and be forgotten. In your name, amen. So we're gonna read uh, the passage this morning, Daniel chapter six, starting in verse 10. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened towards Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree? that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any God or human being except to you, your majesty, would be thrown into the lion's den? The king answered, the decree stands in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. Then they said to the king, Daniel, who is one of your exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, your majesty, or to the decree you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. When the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. He was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sundown to save him. Then the men went as a group to King Darius and said to him, remember your majesty that according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, no decree or edict that the king issues can be changed. So the king gave the order and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, may your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the rings of his nobles, so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without any entertainment being brought to him, and he could not sleep. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, may the king live forever. My God sent his angel and he shut the mouth of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I ever done any wrong before you, your majesty." The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound 
was found on him because he had trusted in his God. And so the theme this morning is waging war. Uh, And the first question I want to ask is, how does God wage war? And this can also serve as a summary for everything that we read up to this point. Uh, Because it is a lot. There's a lot of history going on here, and um, it's important to review. (laughs) It's easy to forget all this stuff. Um, We've been going through the reading plan and reading bits and pieces of Israel's history here. Uh, But God's chosen kingdom, uh, the the Jewish people, have been doing really, really evil stuff. Even we would be like, whoa, you're actually doing that bad stuff? And it's, I try to keep this G-rated because it's a a kid's service, so I'm not going to tell you what they've been doing. But it was really bad. They kept choosing evil. God kept saying, stop it, stop it, stop it. But they kept choosing evil. Jeremiah 52.3 says, It was because of the Lord's anger that all this happened to Jerusalem and Judah. And in the end, he thrust them from his presence. They kept doing those evil things. The Bible says God is slow to anger, but that doesn't mean he never gets angry. At some point, God couldn't let the bad things that they were doing keep going. So his justice and purification needed to take place. This resulted in the Babylonian Empire coming in and taking over that southern kingdom of Judah. And in the southern kingdom, that's where the capital city Jerusalem is. And everything was destroyed. The temple was laid to ruin. The capital city was laid to ruin. And this is where we first meet Daniel. He's being carried off. um, And I picture him like in a whole like train of people looking behind his shoulder into seeing a completely destroyed city. And now Daniel lives in a foreign city. Uh, Can you imagine how Daniel felt? Can you imagine seeing like our home city destroyed or like our home church destroyed? Like what would would your first reaction be? What would you want to do? But even though times are really, really hard, Daniel never loses hope. Uh, He is part of that remnant of people who never gave up. Even though God was angry, um, there was still hope. And Daniel remains faithful. Uh, Apparently, he listened to those prophets who said that there would be a hero rising up eventually, uh, and he did not lose hope. And now we have uh, the passage this morning. Um, How does Daniel wage war against evil? Um, If it were me, um, and I was rising up to power and earning trust within uh, the Babylonian Empire, I would be tempted to overthrow everything. I'd be tempted to earn the trust of the king and maybe poison him or something like that. Uh, But Daniel does not do that. He does not resort to violence. Uh, He wages war with authenticity and with prayer. Um, From day one, Daniel trusted God. Um, He he remained a hard worker, he had a good attitude, and he moved up the ranks in government. Um, He was a Jewish person, so he didn't want to uh, eat non-kosher food, so he kept that commitment. Uh, He did not get drunk on wine or anything like that. And most importantly, he only prayed to the true God of the Bible and not to other kings or other gods. In this passage, there's a decree that is passed. Uh, Several men were jealous of Daniel, uh, and they were attempting to trap Daniel using his authenticity. They convinced the king to pass a law that said, you have to pray to the king instead of to God. They knew that they could trap Daniel no other way. Uh, He was too good a person. Uh, And I love what happens here. Daniel hears about this law, like, oh, I'm not supposed to pray to God. What's the first thing he does? He goes and prays to God. (laughs) Uh, He immediately goes upstairs in his room and prays. It's just part of who he is. He's an authentic believer. Um, One of my favorite books is uh, this one. It's called uh, As King Fishers Catch Fire. So there's a picture on the screen. There's also a physical copy here in case you want to look at it afterwards. It's called As King Fishers Catch Fire. It's by Eugene Peterson. Uh, even though he's from a different Christian denomination, uh, he was an amazing believer, amazing writer, amazing pastor, amazing preacher. And I love reading this book. I usually read this book when I go on vacation. It's a summary of all of his sermons talking about authenticity, or the word he uses is uh, uh, congruence. It can be really helpful for just kind of, I don't know, relaxing and focusing on God. Um, The title of the book, As Kingfishers Catch Fire, is from a poem from another Christian poet. Uh, His name is Gerard Manley Hopkins. Uh, We don't have time to go through it line by line, but the first line, which is also the line of the poem, is called As Kingfishers Catch Fire. 
A kingfisher is a type of bird. It's actually the largest bird that is able to hover, kind of like a, um, a hummingbird, but like a lot bigger, not this tiny little thing. And it's really cool too, like they're hovering and like their heads look like they're on like some sort of like GoPro thing. It's like really stable, really, really cool birds. Anyway, I spent too much time watching YouTube videos about birds this week, but it's fine. Um, so, the, uh, so they're beautiful birds as the picture is here. They're hovering over the water and they shoot down and they catch a fish and they're really good at it. That's why they're called kingfishers. And a lot of times too, they have like a mohawk after they <laughs> leave the water. They're really cool looking. Uh, and this poem is talking about, uh, the poet is looking at these birds fishing and just saying, wow, God created this bird to do this beautiful thing. And the bird is just doing it. He's being his authentic self. And it's this beautiful thing. And uh, we don't have time to read the whole poem, but we're encouraged to be like that. If we are truly living our authentic self in the best possible way that is focusing on Jesus and not sinning or, sinning or anything like that. We are like this kingfisher. It's a beautiful thing. It's natural. And just being authentic, following God's plan. And this is what Daniel is doing. Uh, he's authentically trusting God um, for, even though it's a hard situation, he's trusting God and his purpose. And I don't think he Daniel understands 100% of what is going on, but he knows he has to pray, and this is how he wages war with evil. I like this verse. He says, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened towards Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed. So there's two things about this verse that this is the thing that we're going to focus on the most today. Is one, he's praying three times a day. We'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, but his window is open towards Jerusalem. I thought I never, I mean, I'm sure I read this before, but I was really thinking about that this week. What do you think he's thinking and feeling and why is he looking towards Jerusalem? Last time he saw Jerusalem, it was I don't know, under siege and being destroyed. Everything was in ruins. I imagine Daniel as a very emotionally healthy individual. He's able to look to the past and feel all the feelings. He's able just to, I think, be sad about how his his home country and city was destroyed. Uh, but he also looked honestly at the sin and the evil that Jerusalem had and how his people uh, were evil. And he's able just to be honest with God about all that stuff. And at the same time, he's able to have hope. Sometimes we think, especially in a American Christianity, sometimes we think if we have a true faith, we won't feel any strong or hard emotions, but that's not the case. Um, Daniel is a good example for us. He's able to have both. He's able to have faith and process those hard emotions. I don't think Daniel, I could in my research, I couldn't find that he prayed this exact prayer, but in Lamentations is like a little mini prayer book for helping people process uh, the whole destruction of their city. I'm just going to read uh, sections from Lamentations chapter 3. I love, it's not going to be on the screen, so just listen. I love the honesty of the hard things that they've seen and experienced, but I also love how they don't give up hope. So this is Lamentations chapter 3. I am the man who has seen affliction by the rod of the Lord's wrath. He has driven me away and made me walk in darkness rather than light. Indeed, he has turned his hand against me again and again all day long. Like how often are there preachers who preach about that? How God has turned his hand against me? Man, we're not used to that honesty. Um, I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those who hope in, whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. David was able to pray authentically like this. This is a really special thing. He embraces the past as well as the future. He embraces all of his emotions, and he does not give up when life gets hard. And I was thinking through the sermon, like, what's the crux of the story here? What's the most important part? Uh, it's easy to think of uh, when Daniel gets lifted out of the lion's den and he's saved. And I'm sure in Sunday school, that's the part that you focus on. And in some ways, that is when they were writing the Bible, that is when the pl plot conflict is resolved. Um, 
and I think even so, like, I find it fascinating that the king was rooting for Daniel. Like, he didn't sleep the night before. He's like, come on, D Daniel, please don't die. And so he lives, and that, that's really a great thing. But when I zoom out a little bit, when I think of Daniel as, uh, as a whole book, and when I zoom out even more, and I think of... Um, when I think of the Old Testament and the whole Bible, I think the crux of the story, the most important part, is Daniel having an authentic faith, uh, praying consistently, and this eventually convinces uh, King Cyrus to allow the Jews to return to Jerusalem. David saw so many kings come and go, but he was consistent. And as much as I, I love Daniel and I'm glad he, saved, uh, he was saved from the lion's den, the bigger plot point is that God used Daniel's faith and his character, his authenticity, and his prayer life to inspire the king to end the exile for everyone. And that is bigger than Daniel being saved from the lion's den. And Daniel's prayer life, it's like that little bayonet charge. It's that one small little thing that had a huge positive effect. And I love his prayer life. Uh, another book I would like to recommend, we're actually reading it as a staff. Uh, it's called Emotionally Healthy uh, Discipleship. He has a whole line of books. This is one we're reading. Uh, this is a, a life-changing book. Uh, that's why we're reading it as a staff. <laughs> it's really, really good. Um, and here he talks about being authentic and diving into s some of like, the hurt of the past, but also being intentional about how often you pray. Um, and Daniel was really intentional with his prayer life. He prayed three times a day. Um, I don't think because Daniel prayed three times a day, then we have to pray three times a day. <laughs> uh, it's easy to read a passage like that and be like, oh, I just have to do that. But I don't think that was the intention of the biblical authors when they wrote that. We do see Daniel as a, a good example, like we're supposed to take our prayer life seriously. Uh, but later in the Bible, uh, Paul addresses a lot of these questions in Romans. Uh, we don't have time to go into it this morning, but we as Christians have the freedom to choose how we worship God and how we uh, connect with God. And this leads us to our next section. Uh, the most practical one is how does a Christian wage war <laughs> against evil in this world? Ephesians chapter 6 states, uh, Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And my aim here is to have you guys take prayer seriously. Uh, realize there's a spiritual battle going on, and uh, I will ask you to consider creating something called a rule of life, quote unquote. So this rule of life, this is something Christians have done for thousands and thousands of years, and it might sound a little intimidating, especially for us Americans, uh, but all it is is essentially a set of commitments, not goals. A goal is something you kind of check off once, but a commitment or a habit that you continually do that help you support and uh, develop and transform your heart, and they support your faith. Uh, so another book recommendation, so there's a, just a couple more here. Uh, I went on vacation a couple weeks ago, so I had time to read this. Um, <laughs> Uh, a Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. This is a really neat, uh, really modern book. Uh, it's by John Mark Comer. Uh, in this book, he talks about uh, a rule of life, and he talks about how that word rule uh, related to the word trellis. Uh, in order for plants to grow, uh, they, and not die, uh, they need something to grow on. I was trying to find some like really, I don't know, in awe-inspiring picture of a trellis in a garden, but this is all I could find. But I think that's probably <laughs> a good thing, is because the things we're talking about here aren't super exciting. They're not, they are life-changing, but they're very, very ordinary. Um, an ordinary plant needs something to grow on. It needs a trellis. And without that structure, it's just going to fall apart uh, and die. And so when we talk about a rule of life or a trellis for our life, um, a lot of us, I think all of us actually, already have a rule of life. It's just the question is whether or not we are intentional about it or not. Um, are we f trying to focus on God and develop our prayer life? Or are we just distracted and entertained with uh, technology and movies and social media and all that good stuff? Um, so two more books, and these are the last ones. So <laughs> uh, The Common Rule and also Habits of the Household. Uh, both are by Justin Whitmell Early. Uh, he's a cool guy, good author. 
Uh, in the common rule, he talks about developing a rule of life for like an everyday person. That's where he gets his name, the common rule. Uh, and also habits of the household. It's really targeted towards parents. And so if you are a parent, I would highly, 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 highly recommend this book. Um, so talk, talk with me about it. Kate and I, we read it on vacation, read a chapter a day. Super easy to read. We've already, we've already been putting things in, in place. Super, super helpful. Uh, especially, he has a whole section devoted to technology. Um, and I love how he phrases it. Technology is not necessarily bad, but it is very powerful. And so we need to use, Christians have always been on the cutting edge of technology. We need to use technology to help our discipleship and not get distracted. Um, but after reading these books, um, I wanted to create like a rule of life for myself. Uh, I've been trying to do this for years, but I haven't really had the time or the energy to really focus on doing it. And it's, they've been kind of fuzzy in my head. Uh, but when my wife and I went on a vacation, I was able to write this down and um, it's more concrete. So uh, I just wanted to share it with you this morning. Um, uh, one of the reasons I wanted to share it with you is just I wanted to live by example and say, hey, I'm trying this. So, so please hold me accountable next week, next month, next year to say, hey, are you actually sticking to this or not? <laughs> and uh, I also am sharing it to hopefully it kind of spurs you on and uh, gives you some creative ideas. And so I went to graphic design school, so I'm a very visual person, so, so this is how my brain works. So the basis of it is uh, three stars. So there are six habits that I want to develop for each point, and there's also a center point for each star, which is like the most important thing, which kind of is a summary of all the other six. And the three stars represent three different time frames, so like a kind of a daily set of habits, a weekly set of habits, and a yearly set of habits. And so that first center point is uh, to experience a daily silence. And it's easy to put prayer there, or reading the Bible first, and those, those will come later. But really, especially in our American culture, just to slow down and then just spend 10 minutes or 20 minutes in silence a day. If, if life gets crazy, like we have two young kids, my wife works, um, it's still crazy after the pandemic. Life gets so crazy sometimes. If I can slow down for 20 minutes and to spend time in silence, oh, I need to do that. That's just really important. And then weekly, I think it's important to, for us to take a Sabbath. So that is to not work for a day at a time, to do all of your work. Again, I think it's, we have, as Christians, we have freedom to choose what we want to do and how we worship God. But for me, it was really important to be able just to, to slow down and spend time with family. And then on a yearly um, time frame, it's important to take a vacation. When my wife and I, when we take a vacation, I mean, I did stuff like this. We have a whole lot of fun and we spend a lot of family time, but it's also, it's important to, to kind of look back at the last year and look forward to the new year. Our vacations are kind of like, kind of like a family new year. Uh, and even the, the last day of vacation, we go out to a fancy dinner, even with the young kids, and we, we talk about what are we thankful for for next, last year and what are we going to do next year. So vacations are, it's not just fun, it's not just entertainment. It's like, it's part of our discipleship process as a family. And then uh, the daily goals, these are just going to be kind of rapid fire. We have praying, uh, reading the Bible, and journaling every day. And then also, too, I like to, to share a meal. So this is usually just uh, with my family. And these aren't like groundbreaking ideas, but just get a full night's sleep and exercise. Not necessarily run a marathon every day, but just get up and walk. Just, just don't sit behind a desk all day. And then for the uh, weekly goals, I like to uh, give, just give uh, time, treasure, talent, just have some sort of outreach component, do something, and then gather as Christians on Sunday morning, gather with other Christians, and then fast. It doesn't necessarily have to be fasting for 24 hours, food or anything like that. Just say, hey, I am not going to look at my cell phone for the rest of the evening. I'm going to fast my cell phone just so I can, uh, so I can pray more. And then uh, pray, I mean, excuse me, play. Um, just do something fun. I love video games, so uh, I like to play video games. Uh, go on a date once a week with my wife. Again, nothing fancy, even if it's just getting lunch with her without the kids. I mean, that's, to have that once a week is really important. 
And then also I'm an introvert, so it's important for me just to be alone and kind of have some uh, time to recharge. And then my yearly goals, um, go on a retreat. I really need to do better at this one. Uh, in past seasons of life, we would, I would be in a better rhythm of going on a retreat with uh, my leadership team, but we need to get back into that routine and be able to go away. Uh, missions trip, do that once a year. And so we're going into work camp in a couple weeks, so that's awesome. I think that's really important. And from like a professional development point of view, just go to a conference once a year and, and learn something new. And then so a getaway, it's a weekend getaway with my wife just to kind of have a little bit of fun there. And then also a day away. So that's the uh, getaway is two times a year. And then the day away is just for me to spend time by myself. So once a season, that's really important. And also too, my wife and I had a goal of every 10 years, every decade kind of going on kind of like a honeymoon type of trip. Uh, we just celebrated our 13th wedding anniversary, so 10 years was like kind of COVID and all that stuff, so that, <laughs> that kind of put um, a damper on that, but we're gonna, we're gonna do something else in the future, so. So, there it is. <laughs> Hopefully, uh, that uh, inspires you uh, to create your own rule of life. Please uh, hold me accountable to that. Um, but most of all, please slow down and connect with God on a continual basis. All of these uh, books that I've read that talk about creating a rule of life, they're essentially all the same thing, all these ones. All of these authors had a crisis. They're all super successful, super smart uh, men in ministry with families, and they met a breaking point. Um, like one of the guys, his spouse quit church, almost gave up her faith. Another guy... Um, actually, two of these guys had nervous breakdowns and wound up in the hospital. Life just got away from them. Life got too busy. Being an American Christian was too much for them. And they needed everything. They reached a breaking point. Everything fell apart. And then they reorganized their life. They created a rule of life. And then they wrote books. And then they, <laughs> they showed us how to do it. So I just really encourage you, take this seriously before you reach a breaking point. Or if you have reached a breaking point, consider uh, reading one of these books or asking one of us for help. And so, in summary, how a Christian wages war, it's not about us, per se. It's not about how powerful we are or how great we are. Uh, we have to slow down and trust God and see how we fit into the bigger plan like Daniel. Like, he was authentic and he prayed. Uh, and as we connect with God and authentically live out his purpose, uh, we are part of that spiritual battle that wages war against evil. And it's really just about what God does and not what we do. And you experience that by embracing your limits and creating a rule of life and sticking to it. And up to this point, uh, we've talked a lot about uh, the, the Old Testament and Daniel and God uh, and some practical ideas. Uh, but as Christians, we really should be focusing on, on Jesus. How does everything point towards Jesus? And so the question I have to end this morning is with, how does Jesus wage war against evil? Jesus said that his kingdom is not of this earth. He does not wage war with physical weapons. Uh, he wages war by sacrificing his life on the cross. So as the band comes up this morning, I just wanted to celebrate communion in remembrance of how Jesus waged war on the cross. When Jesus was on trial, uh, he was silent. The men trying to catch him and trying to kill him, they were trying to get him to say anything that would make him worthy of death. Jesus absolutely could have outsmarted all the men and he could have escaped death if he wanted to. Um, but at the end of his trial, he says he's the son of God and Jesus says, I am the son of man. And saying that phrase, I am the son of man, that is what... Uh, put the rulers over the edge. Saying those words is what caused him to die. And what Jesus was doing is that he was quoting Daniel chapter 7. Uh, so I'm going to read Daniel chapter 7, and this is what cost Jesus his life. In my, this is Daniel speaking, in my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. 
All nations and peoples of every language worshiped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So by quoting Daniel, Jesus is saying, I am that hero that was, has been promised. I am the one sent from God. I am the hope of all mankind. I have all authority, glory, and sovereign power. And saying that is what cost him his life. And this is what we remember um, when we take communion. And so if you have a cup, we can take communion together. And so this is from uh, 1 Corinthians. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So let's take the bread together. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's take the cup together. And let's pray. Jesus, thank you that you are the promised hero. Help us know that in our heart. If any of us have not accepted you as the hero of mankind, have, if any of us have not asked for forgiveness, I pray that we do that today. Help us experience true freedom. Forgiveness is true freedom, and following you gives us life. And for those of us who have trusted you with our whole life, um, help us take our prayer life seriously. Help us see that we can be part of the battle against good and evil in this world. There is purpose in life, and we need to slow down and connect with you in a real, authentic way on a consistent basis to really understand what you're telling us. We are human. <laughs> we have limits. Teach us to embrace those limits and help us live just a true, healthy, and free life. And help us follow whatever plan you have for us. Sometimes that plan is really, really hard and you have us go through really hard things, but help us not give up hope. Uh, in those hard times, help us cling to our spiritual disciplines more and not less. Help us trust you in a deep uh, and new way because your mercies are new every morning. In your name, amen. Think about what we've just been listening to and what the word is saying. We're going to sing the song we finished on and change a little of our plans. We're just going to stand to our feet and we're just going to sing that chorus. Jesus is good. He's wonderful. He's amazing. So sing, Your name is like honey in my lips. Your name is like honey on my lips. Your spirit's like water to your word is a lamp unto my feet Jesus I love you I love you your name is like honey on my lips your spirit's like water to my soul your word is a lamp this morning comes from Revelation chapter 21. It's at the very end of the Bible. He says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth has passed away and there is no longer a sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, 
and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Let's pray. Jesus, help us live with hope and authenticity of, of heaven, of the new Jerusalem, of you living with us uh, in an undeniable way. I pray uh, that Holy Spirit transform our hearts, help us authentically live out a faith towards you. In your name, amen. Thank you guys. Happy Fourth of July. You are dismissed.